Greg Patterson here from ANL Laboratories. Just going to talk a little bit on why use a soil health test and just a little bit of history on soil health and where we're at and just what we see going forward in production agriculture and the, the need to identify and understand the microbial activity in the, in the interaction with plants. Back when I was consulting to, to growers on small fruit veg and vegetable production, uh, very interested in the interaction to uh, soil plant interaction with nutrients and some of the microbials in the soil and had the opportunity to work with a good friend of mine, Dr. George Lazarzovitz at the Federal Research Station, who his whole career was based on that. And I would take questions to him on why things weren't happening. We're trying to do um, less use or less dependence on fungicide application and, and work with soil-borne diseases and just using cultural practices try to avoid the use of some of these, these products. And at this time, George uh, actually was starting to work on a very extensive project with uh, global research in potato production, understanding uh, what was a disease suppressive soil and how we could do something to, to reduce the amount of disease incidence globally on the potato crop. He was working with uh, Dr. Sean Hemmingson from um, uh, NRC. And the work they were doing there is they're trying to fingerprint soils from all around the world and, and look at what is the biological component of soils and, and how are these different microbes com um, interacting with plants and just, just what was the makeup. They figured that they would be able to take a fingerprint of any soil and tell where it came from. What they found out was that wasn't the case, that all soils had the same complement of, of, of microbes, fungi and bacteria worldwide. Uh, then the question was, you know, how, how come and, and what are they doing? So at some point in time, George and I went back and forth for quite some time and said, we need to take this information to production agriculture. It is the missing link. It is what people need to understand because it is uh, the future in agriculture. We then looked at coming up with a company and starting a company on just doing that, looking at what is a disease suppressive soil, how do we understand soil health, and just where do we go with this information, and, and what does it mean? In 2009, we built this facility called a Biologicals, and completely dedicated to understanding that and, and actually going after that holy grail that George called a disease suppressive soil. What we did there was we wanted to identify who these microbes were, and how the host was selecting these microbes and, and how it was responding to them. But more importantly, what were they doing and how was the host actually cultivating these organisms and keeping them in, in the rhizosphere. We quickly identified that there was, a, there was something going on in that rhizosphere. We found that in a very productive field, the rhizosphere biological population would change. It would change from what the diverse population was to something that was more selected and the plant was actually doing this. So how was this plant actually cultivating this rhizosphere? This wasn't new. Uh, this individual, Hitler, back in uh, 1903, already figured this out. He already identified the fact that the plant changed the rhizosphere population of microbes by going out and selecting organisms from the bulk soil and then cultivating this, this, this good population of microbes. So we need to understand that and how was the plant doing this and, and what was the signaling that was going on there. A lot of people don't understand that the plant expends a lot of energy um, to cultivate these bugs. 20 to 60 percent of the photosynthates the plant produces, a lot of energy that plant expends on feeding these microbes and returning those, those sugars and those carbons to the rhizosphere. So the carbon source that it, these bugs are feeding on is actually coming from the plant and understanding how the plant does that is the next step. These organisms or these compounds are excluded, excluded uh, exuded from the mucilage of the plant and in, in doing that these complicated compounds that the plant puts together are actually there for a reason in actually selecting for some of these microbes and maintaining this population in the rhizosphere. This slide here shows the difference between a highly productive field and a, a field that's not quite as productive the top slide is the less productive field with a lot of diversity. The bottom slide is the slide where the plant has actually got rid of the diversity, selected for certain organisms, and cultivated and um, maintained that population in the rhizosphere. So we think about this, if these bugs can actually provide nutrients for the plant uh, and the plant has the ability to manipulate these, why isn't that happening? Well, it is happening in theory. Uh, you don't have to fertilize a weed. Weeds already do that. 
The reason why they can do that is we have not messed with weeds, they have evolved over time, and they've retained that phenotypic relationship with these organisms, and they know how to identify them very quickly. The plants we have today are monoculture, we've bred that out of them, uh, and what we have to do now is figure out how culturally we can actually help support those plants to send out those signals and bring those back into the rhizosphere. So when you look at microbial diversity, and everybody in soil health and soil quality are talking about the big uh, diversity of things, uh, diversity is not necessarily the best thing. These plants can't feed all these, these, these organisms, so they are selectively getting rid of some of them and only harvesting or cultivating the ones that they, they, they require to do the job. Where green manures fit in this, or cover crops, we have a crop out there that feeds these, these microbes, then we harvest it, these microbes go on a starvation diet, Putting a cover crop or green manure, regardless of what it is, is going to maintain some of that sugar source for these bugs to keep that population alive and active for when we go back in the field for the next crop. So we look at nutrition in our soil health test that we have today. We look at all these different um, elements that we can control, how we can feed the plant, and in, in feeding the plant certain compounds. How does that correlate to the population of different organisms in, in the field? And that's where our soil health test is today. We now know what organisms the plant, or some of the organisms the plant uses. We don't know all the answers just yet. That's an ongoing pro project. But we do have a good understanding of what, what nutrients are feeding what organisms and how the plant is actually creating these compounds to feed these bugs and how this plant is signaling out into the bulk soil to bring these bugs into the rhizosphere to complement what the plant's doing. So we got a fairly good understanding of what that's doing. Uh, this is an algorithm we've developed based on that. This is, goes into our soil health index, uh, a very strong correlation to, to yield and quality of crop based on these parameters uh, that we've built into that index that we use now in our soil health test. So this is a Vitellus test, or soil health test. It's designed to help farmers understand some of this and how they can manipulate that and help uh, the plant do the job it has to do. Um, simply when you look at that test, you look at uh, the ranges we've, we've, uh, we've put here on these graphs. If something's outside these ranges, anything you can do to bring that particular parameter or nutrient back into that range helps. Uh, we've got it for a bunch of different things that we do control and can control that you can manipulate and bring into place to, to again, move the soil health index in the happy range. Some place between, the um, index goes from 0 to 60, some place be above 40 and up is where you want to be. Nothing's really happening in that rhizosphere much below 40. We don't see a lot of difference in microbial populations. Uh, we see things changing, we see a lot of things happening, but we really don't see any real achievement in, in quality and yield predictability until we go over 40. To add to this now, we have our biological test. A lot of people have asked us for this. In the past, we've had some plates and some tests that uh, you could go in mid-season and, and pull out of the field. Nobody really wanted to do that. A lot of work mid-season, uh, so that really didn't, uh, a lot not, wasn't a lot of take up on that. But we've come up with this new test called our, our bio test. Again, it's correlated to the soil health test itself. It takes information off the soil health test. Uh, to put together some of the correlations between these parameters, which is the bottom scale. Uh, the top scale is just a, a reading of the microbes that we identified as some of the good bugs that are actually helping the plant uh, with its yield and performance, and we can measure those, and we now know how the plant responds to those and how we can manipulate those. So hopefully this will clear up some of that. Um, unfortunately, there's not a, de not a detail on here that explains what's going on, but we have a, an eight-page tech bulletin that really extensively explains how this works and how these relationships work between the biologicals. So with that, I hope this explains what our soil health is all about. Um, stick with us, stay with us. Uh, more to come. Uh, this will evolve over time as we continue our research. So when we look at this, we really have to understand the fertility. We can do something about it. Uh, it's not about nitrogen, it's about all the other nutrients and how we balance that or balance the fertility package we deliver to the plant so it can use those nutrients to produce the carbon sources to cultivate these organisms. Thank you.